right, it's 9.02. Uh, let's get the meeting started. Um, <coughs> are you ready to roll call? Yes. Do we have Tom Yep. Agenda two on um, the approval of the minutes from December 13, 2022. I have a motion. Well, I'll make a motion. I think it must okay. I think we have a motion and a second to approve the minutes. Uh, any discussion? All right. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed say nay. Any exceptions? Oh. All right. Motion passes. Going to number three, my favorite. Hope you ready to be heard. Everybody present. Oh. Number four, organizational updates. They, uh, Destiny. Well, do we want to let's let's do let's go through introductions first. That, that so let's, yeah, do I think that. that sounds let's do that now. Right? <laughs> yeah. I was looking for the. It's okay. Four C. Yeah. Oh, 4C. Let's move 4C up. Okay. So, um, let's just go around the table with introductions. My name is Tom D. I am the, currently the board chair. Uh, I'm Jean Christopher. I am, uh, I've been on this board for almost five years now. Yeah. Um, and I'm also a representative of the residents. I try to be. Okay, can I pause for a minute? Yeah. Can you just do a brief back? What background? Your background. Yeah, yeah. I was thinking about that afterwards. Um, <laughs> so I worked for, worked for, for CU um, as an accounting director. <laughs> um, I'm a CPA. Um, I've been on the board now for three years. Yeah. Um, and I've been in Lockmont for uh, almost 18 years. I already did what you did that. Okay. Um, Arlene Zorman, I've been on the board now, this is going on three years, and ever since I've been on until now, it was always on Zoom. So uh, I've lived in Longmont five years, lived here originally back a long time ago. Um, and I came from Salt Lake City where I was program manager for the aging and adult services. I'm Tracy King Francesco. I work um, I work for the city of Longmont, but I'm, <laughs> it's, it's confusing. I'm the housing compliance manager. Lisa Gallinar, I'm the regional manager for Longmont Housing Authority. I oversee the nine um, property, prop, apartment properties <laughs> and the two commercial properties. My name is Lauren Selly. Um, I've been on the board for three years. Uh, Tom and Arlene and I started at the same time. Um, I have a background in the legal field, I was a paralegal for almost 20 years. Did you know that same? I work for Boulder County Housing Authority now as a um, senior housing developer. I worked for Boulder County 10 years. Um, I do not currently live in Longmont, but I used to live in Longmont. I've lived here twice already. I'm originally from Florida. Um, and out of all the places I've lived, which is Longmont, Boulder, and now Louisville, Longmont is like I 
recall from our interviews, you have some voucher holders as your tenants, correct? Because the voucher program is familiar from the from the user's um, I'm Molly O'Donnell. I am the housing director for the city of Longmont. And the housing, thank you. The housing authority is the staff is housed in that division. So I, in terms of LHA, I don't have a formal title, but I am the catch-all for everything um, miscellaneous that doesn't necessarily fit into properties or voucher program. Um, and so I assist Harold on a lot of the either um, escalated issues or just miscellaneous. And Harold will be here shortly. He's the executive director. He'll probably introduce, introduce himself. Executive director of the Housing Authority and the city manager. Well, I'm also new. My name's Carrie. Um, I lived in Albuquerque before here, and I practiced law there for over 10 years, including doing some stuff in the state as a prosecutor and also doing construction and defect work. Um, so I know some of the terms, not a ton, but <laughs> a little bit. Um, my husband and I moved here just because we just really loved it. We looked all around the front range. We thought we'd end up in Denver, but it didn't happen. We visited Longmont a lot of times and just fell in love with it. It's just an amazing community, so I'm just trying to get more and more involved in that community, and that's, that's about it. Awesome. Sarah Rooney with the Fruit Police Department. Um, been in law enforcement 24 years. Been working in the housing industry for about 13 years, um, running our crack free housing program, so many of you are very familiar with that. Um, and I've been working with LHA since 2010, pretty much when Crime Free started. She's, she's taken on a role from the city side and really helping us build partnerships and expand, Sarah, expand. Sorry. Um, <laughs> I mean, I think uh, just having that relationship, definitely we've built and, and I think there's opportunity to, be, to become more robust with, within public safety and some of the other things that Harold and Molly and I talked about within LHA and with city partners. Nonprofits too. So are you on member now on the board, or is it more of a partnership? She's, she's on. She's a staff. Yeah, okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Very good. Um, my name is Eric Camaras. I am the executive assistant for the city manager's office. So, um, like Sister Carol is the executive director. I have had um, the LHA board meeting. So, any questions that you have in regards to the advisory board, feel free to. And I also do <laughs> 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 Just coordinate all the, the business. Anything else involved with or Yeah. So in terms of orientation, um, so there I, I met with the city clerk's office yesterday who manages the, the city boards and granted LHA is a little bit of a an odd um, you know, a little bit different than traditional city boards since we serve um, to advise the LHA Board of Commissioners, not necessarily City Council, even if they're the same people. Um, so I asked what their orientation process is, and I'm not sure if anybody's heard from them yet, but they are planning on setting up orientation for all the new board members, so that will be coming. And then in the meantime, I've got some resources from them that I can get to you all, and they're really about um, um, what it really means to be the Open Records Act in Colorado, the Sunshine Law, what an open meeting is supposed to entail, um, and then the Roberts Rules of Parliamentary Procedure, which is what when you see the, the motioning and everything, if you're not familiar, that's where that's all based out of, and there's some a guide for that, what, that, what that's about. So um, for today, we'll just kind of follow along with, let Tom lead the, the procedure, and then um, I'll be able to provide that to you just to review. Um, is email okay contact for everybody? Because I think we should put together an email list if we don't already, um, and then I'll get that stuff out that way. I think there's a video, the ethics section of the video is what they said to pay the most attention to, at least from the very start. Um, so we'll be sending that out. I think it, you could go on and on about them, and I don't want to spend too much time today. We have a lot of other things, but what we do want to spend time on with you is an orientation to the LJ. So, I don't need one, I've got it up here, so I'll pass those around. These were not in your packet since they were still in development as of this morning. Yeah. I think Eric did. Yeah. But this is a revised edition. Oh, whoops. I, <laughs> yeah. These are revised. Um, 
They just added a couple of details, something about that. mission and vision we really want to be the resource for housing low and moderate income families in Lama um, and households with disabilities so we really want to be the leader in the industry we have other providers in our community that we seek to partner with and together um, do the best work we can do and provide the most housing opportunity that we can provide for residents in need in our community um, so we really want to give a little bit of a background. You can you can browse this top section at your, at your leisure, but I want to give a little bit of background on why the city and the LHA are so jointly tied. Um, so in years past, the LHA was established in the 70s, and then uh, it is a quasi-governmental organization. And in about 2019, we've always the city and the LHA have partnered together forever um, for hunt, I'm sorry, funding opportunities or just going over issues together. Um, there was plenty of history there as partners. And then in 2019, LHA board, um, which was not the city council at the time, it was a separately appointed board, um, reached out to the city asking for greater partnership to help fix some issues. There was um, financial stability issues. I see here we're coming, he's probably going to Back after this conversation. Um, and just there was turnover compliance leadership. issues, turnover of leadership, turnover of staff. Um, so they reached out to the city to help. And in that process, we figured out how many affinities the city and the LHA had and how much how much work we could bring together to make it the operation so much better. For example, partnering with public safety to have like um, I'm giving a little LHA background. I already introduced you to pay your face injury. Sorry, I had a boost my kid's car. <laughs> so there were so many affinities that coming together made so much sense to help get the housing authority on a good financially sound help with some of the HUD compliance requirements that really needed uh, a lot of work to get over that hump um, and help figure out an organizational culture that would promote retention and just a positive positive place to be. So any comments from you? Basically I've just introduced why the city and LHA are working together and how beneficial it's been for the operations of LHA. Could you talk about the necessity of why it happened? Um, in very basic terms. Okay. Clients help, um, staff turnover help, financial stability help. That was all part of it. Um, Genesis really started, um, actually this is probably more, 10 years in the making when everything that Pollock started in terms of financials. The, uh, the revenue model for the housing authority was really built on development and using the development revenue to bolster the operational revenue and 
then they got behind on development, so then the revenue picture started looking pretty bleak. We've always talked about all of that. And then I think everything culminated with, for those of you all that are, I don't know how long you all been in Long Rock, but there was an issue actually that occurred here, of which um, involved the housing authority in the city. And it was when they utilized the city's canine units to come in and as a training exercise that then led to um, obviously a lot of media coverage on Channel 9 uh, and um, violated the rules in terms of posting and how you approach it. And, and so interestingly enough on that at that time, Gene, you may have been on the board. I was. Oh, well, I, I came on right after. Right after. Gene yeah. came on, on right after. Um, interestingly enough, the city and the housing authority were not on the same page right. in terms of how we were going to handle this issue. And um, so it turned into a bit of a battle between the two of us. And, um, and so our approach as the city was um, our officers that were doing this were not um, properly informed by the housing authority staff in terms of what they could do not to minimize our, our, our impact as well. They also didn't raise it to their chain of command. And so we went into um, uh, settlement negotiations before a lawsuit was ever filed. We just said, look, we messed this up. Um, and, uh, ACLU. ACLU. ACLU, we want to start talking to you about settlement. Uh, we settled pretty quickly. Um, if you all were here, you may have seen Mike Butler and myself talking about this issue. We just owned our mistake, um, settled with them, and then after a while, the housing authority settled. So we, they kind of keep going. Um, picture gets out of the staff. Now Gene is on the board at this time, I think. Mm -hmm. Um, where they were recognizing the top news stories at the Titans call and the housing authority director was in the picture of like the Olympics were going on and it got out and so at that point the housing the mayor at the time the Agri, um, and the leadership because the mayor points the board was like yeah, you got to deal with this and so everything shifted dramatically and so then they brought in Luffy from Loveland as sort of a bridge, stabilized it. I don't think anyone had a full idea of what was going on. Jillian then came in, and I'm giving you this detail because it really explains kind of what we've had to go through in terms of stabilizing it. So Jillian comes in uh, as the executive director, um, really struggles, didn't have the staffing that they needed. Uh, Insinuates that she's looking for another job, the board kind of comes to us and starts talking. Because at that point, um, from an organizational perspective, um, I call it a death spiral. That's kind of what we were in, is a death spiral. And, uh, and so eventually we start working on it. And at that point, it was Karen Roney, Kathy Fedler, myself initially starting on this. Uh, we, we then started bringing in about 15 to 20 people from the city to try to bolster what's going on in different capacities. I just want to add, just as that story of why I did it, that was before. There was like no separation of duties. So there were a lot of violations of ethics. Not that people may, may or may not be doing bad things, but there were no checks and balances. We didn't have the staff capacity at the LHA. So we really needed the city to step in. So we, we averaged on all of the audits anywhere from 7 to 15 fines on every audit. Um, so we start digging into this, and, and to be frank, and I said this publicly before, when we were in this meeting, um, I don't think any of us really wanted to do this, um, just because we very quickly started getting a sense of the work, but we realized we had to do it. Uh, and failure wasn't an option. And that's kind of how we all then approached it. It's like, we can't fail, failure's not an option, we have to do it. Um, so then they originally contract where they put me on the board with you all 
as an operating executive board member. Right. Right. Yeah. And that was kind of confusing. Um, and so, so we've gone through multiple phases of what we need to do. Yeah. Eventually shifting it to where the city council is the housing authority board, similar to Boulder County. Uh, we flipped you all into the advisory board, which I think is incredibly important because with what the council has on their plate, it's too hard to, to really do what we do because there is a, a, a really direct link in terms of how we work with you all, how you all work with the residents. Um, you all, and I'll look at um, the four board members that have been here, they've been incredibly supportive uh, in helping us through things. You know, I can talk about, you know, Tom and the work that he's done on the, the reviewing the auditor and being part of that. Uh, Lauren obviously has a lot of experience, talks to Molly about development projects and then Jean and Arlene helping to support the residents and what we're trying to do there. So we, this really is a partnership, this staff and the board, because no one group can do this. Um, we found a tremendous amount of financial issues. Basically, they were understaffed. And I'm gonna go into a little bit more detail to kind of try to give you a sense of where we're coming from. Again, I apologize. This has been a bad start to the year. Daughter got a concussion Sunday night at work. So it's just not a good start to the new year. Um, but um, so anyway, um, financially, what we then really completely realized was um, the development cycle got off. And when the development cycle got off, it completely ruined their financial picture. When we step in, we're, we're getting into the resyndication of Aspen Meadows apartments. And um, literally the first thing that hit us in that is that the equity investor that was supposed to be involved in the resyndication dropped out. And so one of the first things that we had to do, so that project was like 95%. All we had to do was close it. This was all in 2020. This is in 2020. Yeah. Thanks. And, and time blends for me on this one, but so the equity investor left. So literally one of the first things that Kathy and I did in conjunction with Sarah Bat or Bot, but um, with Start, she's our financial consultant that does all of our work when we go and issue tax credits. We just, she started getting people on the phone with us trying to salvage the project to get an equity investor in. And, and so what we realized when we look at it in general, um, they were spending around $175,000 on their executive director. They were spending about 100 to 115,000 on their chief financial officer. So you just look at those two numbers. Um, and then you look at what was happening in terms of the staffing and how much they were paying the pro their property managers, how much they actually had to pay maintenance and fill maintenance, and what they had to do uh, uh, accounting so that you can have robust accounting positions in for separation of duties. So when we came in, we were like, all right, we've got to eliminate these upper level positions. We've got to bolster those. And we started looking at what the city could do. So that was, what they were paying for IT support, which wasn't working. So the city came in and we took over IT, all the back office functions, so information technology purchasing, everything that you would see in there. Uh, with the money that we were able to save, we've now created, and I almost forget Kendra's title, um, accounting supervisor, um, and that's Kendra Daniels, um, an accountant, and an accounting technician, which the organization I don't think has ever had that robust of a financial backbone to it ever. And so, and that is completely separate. That is actually overseen by um, ultimately the city's chief financial officer and our, um, what is the next title? Director of Accounting or what? Something like that. So that's completely separate. Uh, we then went in and started benchmarking um, all of the positions and really looking at how we were going to structure it. We structured it by bringing Lisa in initially as more of a regional property manager. Uh, and then it took us about a year 
to, to really hire everyone in place that we needed from the very beginning. Sarah's been with us in terms of helping us try to stabilize everything and bridge public safety. Um, what Molly may not know, and even Lisa, is even before then, Sarah and I would, would talk occasionally about the Housing Authority and the lack of engagement that they would have with Sarah and police when they were bringing issues forward. And so, Jean? Um, when the confusion was going on after the incident here, mm -hmm. um, all of LHA staff was told not to do anything related to crime reporting. It was pulled out. Yeah, well, we didn't know that either. Yeah. Which is incredibly important because uh, when we get to you, when we get to operationally what we saw. So we were dealing with the death spiral financially where the organization was coming. Um, there was not a number of the staff needed to really support the facilities. Uh, and and frankly, none of us had ever done this before, other than just taking management principles and understanding what we've done on housing. And so very quickly, we started um, bringing in people who had done this. We did, we did a report with uh, Betsy Martins, Martins mm -hmm. who used to run Boulder uh, Housing Partners, really gave us a good kickoff in what we needed to do. And so we started working. Um, the thing that I told both this board and the city council was um, it's probably going to be about five years before we're, we're in the point where we're doing development work. This is really more of a testament to the work that people like Karen and Kathy and Molly and Lisa and all the staff did. About a year into it we started seeing the light at the end of the tunnel and so we made the decision that yeah let's go ahead and start going on development. We had one come forward and very quickly we went into the development process on it. So where we are today is um, within the first year of taking over the financials, we went down to three to five findings. Interestingly enough, we had already made the corrections, but because we were already in the year, those findings still had to stick. The last audits that we went through in terms of the LHA audits, we had zero findings. Um, we had one finding on the LHC audit and, was also fixed. and that was already fixed, but that was the one that was lagging on us because we wanted to deal with LHA. Um, the relationship with HUD is in a drastically different place than it was. Uh, we just went through the big audit on the Lodge and Hearthstone because they're a 202 property. Uh, when we went through the debrief on the audit, the guy said it is like night and day different. Um, and he said, you're going to get a satisfactory goes, but I can't go above that because that will bring the attention of DC because rarely have we ever seen anyone make that drastic of a movement. From unsatisfactory to, to uh, I think it's above average. Above, above, yeah. satisfactory. <laughs> and, um, and so we, we did get satisfactory. Um, but it was interesting. <clears throat> We've had some conversations with HUD on other issues and what we found out is they were about to come to the city ask us to get involved even before the board did. And I just want to add at this time too, there the relationship between the city and LHA is very contentious given what happened. And for reasons that I wasn't aware of because at the time I didn't work for the housing authority, um, I was just trying to be on the board because I lived here and didn't want to leave something in housing. And there was a lot of distrust between and like competition between Boulder County Housing Authority, Longmont Housing Authority, and there's some bad, bad juju and blood there a little bit. I did some big use of being spy at one point when I joined. Yes, I mean, no. the, the no. acting yeah. chairperson at the time was like, Why are you interested in this? Did they plant you here? And I was like, I'm not going to tell you what I'm going to tell I, I push paper. <laughs> I, have no, I have no say. So um, having the relationships be fixed. I mean, they're in a much better place than they were. And it's oh, been awesome. It, it, totally, totally. Because um, working under that mess, and um, you caught me on, you know, I was still, you know, a nervous cat. Um, but it was like cats fighting. 
but you know, for, for about a good six months, it was terrible. Um, and like, like you said, it was um, distrust everywhere. Um, but um, having, uh, having the city come in um, and, and get it straightened out so quickly, so quickly, um, and because the, the skills are, are with the city, and 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 I'll add this: we've got skills now on additional skills on the board that we are excited about with all of you, all the new people. It's 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 phenomenal, but it, it has been one heck of a struggle, and I was so delighted uh, a few months back when you when we brought Sarah on mm -hmm. uh, to see that happen again. You didn't know that it had. No, no. no. So yeah. we were. We had to pull it out of all the all of the. Um, Crime free had nothing to do with the incident no, here. No, not at all. It was. I didn't it know was, anything about that. It was that the attitude. That's the other thing. One of the things, and, and I, I was trying to get to this point. Harold mentioned when we were talking about going under the city. One of the things that really, really excited me was Harold stressing transparency. Mm -hmm. It's like, yeah, we're gonna have we're gonna have problems, but we need to bring out the problem and solve it. Not bring out the problem and blame somebody. Let's bring it out and let's resolve it. And that approach has it, it's paying off it, by millions, honestly. It, it's paying off. It's beautiful. And I'll, I'll just I want to come at you and I, and you and the staff on making it much more. Um, approachable. It, 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 it's working. So, so yeah. So, so then we we started really understanding what was going on on the properties, and uh, this is not the conversation that we enjoy. But accountability was lacking in all of our properties, and so we were seeing issues of drug use. We were seeing uh, significant behavior issues, um, and we got kind of caught because um, if you think about when we took over and what we were doing, then COVID hit and everything got crazy, especially in this world, because you couldn't do evictions and everything else. So um, unless they were um, uh, significant evictions that threatened their life, the health, safety, of uh, the residents, and we actually did a few during COVID because of those issues. Uh, but where we're what we ended up in once we started coming out of the COVID issues is is literally um, we went through a run where about every Friday Lisa was in court um, with dealing with evictions and and managing these issues, and so. Uh, the best example that I can give you is when, when we took over this uh, facility here was probably averaging what, 15, 15, 20 calls for service a week. Yeah, a week. Yeah. A week. Yeah. And, yeah. And, and so we're down to one or two. Two, three in a lot of the welfare checks. Yeah, and so it's in terms of the, the livability for the residents, which is at the forefront of our minds is every resident. <clears throat> our obligation is to provide a safe a home place for people to leave. And unfortunately, you have to bring accountability in this and you do have to evict people. But <clears throat> if you don't do it, it's gonna be chaos. And um, and this has probably been, from a staff perspective, and this is the center property managers, uh, the most significant turnaround we're now able to, and what we've done, so basically the city contract is from the beginning of the day, us uh, about $120,000. Um, that covers some of Molly's time, some of my time, and um, and the accounting and the IT work, but to, to put in perspective, what we're able to do with the economy of scale is basically hire all the financial staff, um, hire more property managers, um, and more maintenance individuals can actually pay market rates for the staff. So we're benchmarking the staffs now from a market basis of you the city. And that's actually also changed the applicant profile in terms of what we're getting in 
And so um, for a hundred grand, I think what we've been able to do is leverage about 300,000 in terms of spinning that off into really putting the positions and filling the positions where the rubber meets the road and serving the residents of these communities. And so that's a little bit more detail than Molly gave you all, but I think detail that was necessary in this budget because we were using so much of Sarah um, we actually put um, a police officer into the position. I think it was a step two police officer so that we can then contract to bring Sarah in where she's more actively engaged in what we're doing and tying that to crime free. And so Sarah will now be at all of these meetings, she'll be at all the housing uh, board meetings and really uh, working with police. They work already together. I just felt bad that I was taking so much time from the police work this and so we funded it but and, and to give you a sense of how it works it's not uncommon on an evening where we have an issue uh, where we have one where um, probably should have involved adult protective services but a son that ran his mom out of a house I mean literally at 7 30 we're on the phone she's coordinating police we're coordinating on how to get the son out of there um, and it all worked out but that's kind of the nature of the work that we do up to and including when we had the shooting at Aspen Meadows, Lisa's in New York, Lisa's texting me, Sarah's texting me, I go out, I interface with the commander, and we're able to use our cameras to then help do some things. And so it is a complete symbiotic relationship with the housing authority in the city, and I think really is um, starting to show the results that I don't think we would have thought of. So, that's my brain job. <laughs> <laughs> so to kind of summarize. Well, one of the, uh, LHDC, you want to mention that? Yeah. Oh, oh, they, we, it, yeah. The Longmont Housing Development Corporation is a nonprofit arm, essentially, of the LHA because, and they were put into place because when it comes to development, if you have your 501c3 board, you are able to get um, access to funds and and do certain things financially on the development side that a housing authority alone can't do. Um, so it's kind of a, we have a separate board, there's three members on it. Um, they really are primarily on the development side of, of all of this, but they do own some of the LAJ properties still. LAJ properties, broad umbrella. Um, they are actually winding down and they're, we're working on at transferring all those assets over to the LAJ and then we'll be thinking about a different method to, to still access some of that funding over time. But there is a, a second board that does serve the LHA. Well, part of it was many, many years ago, um, HUD frowned upon housing authorities developing projects. In addition, what we found out is the community didn't want the housing authority to develop projects. And, and we're going back maybe about 30 years ago. But with the HUD rules, most housing authorities created development corporations to parallel their structure. Um, HUD removed that a few years ago, I'd probably say about 50 years ago. And so we can now do the same thing that the development corporation did. And when Betsy reviewed it, um, and we were looking at the financial strength of an organization, it made sense to bring those together. And the LHDC board, because they weren't developing projects, was really starting to go, why are we here? We're not doing anything, we're just meeting the need. And so they were, and it's sort of been the same people for many, many years, and they were like, we're tired, we wanna retire. And, and so then that's when we started the competition of the two. Part of that's kind of just the modernization of public housing and going from what the stereotypical version of it that was coming out, you know, 70s and 80s to to the more modern, um, more integrated, diverse housing stock, you know, all of the, the ways that people try and make public housing uh, more integrated in the community now rather than what you think of when you think of what was built in that time. Um, so I wanted to touch on since the city partnered since 2020, really what have we accomplished? Um, and Harold basically hit everything, and I'm just gonna summarize. Organizational culture, staff stabilization, financial stabilization, compliance stabilization with our HUD findings and new 
we're audited at the Wazoo on every property, on every funding source. Um, really getting that stuff in order was all part of that stabilization piece. We feel like we've gotten there, it's, it's a constant. We're still finding old things to fix. But overall, what that has done is, is change swap, um, I should say flip the head on LHA's reputation in the community and with our partners. And that was critical because now we are getting, that's being recognized, people are coming to us <laughs> asking to partner, um, and we've been able to, quicker than we anticipated, start getting into that development realm. And at the same time, when the city was granted all of the American Rescue Plan Act funding, and the city council decided to, to dedicate a large chunk of that to affordable housing, and because of the partnership with LHA, still a bunch of that funding is dedicated to projects that will benefit the LHA. Um, so now we have a wave of development, plus we have more proposals coming to us than we can even juggle. Um, so development is a huge arm right now, and that's something that's really critical to um, the future years of operations for LHA. And the voucher program is, these are like the three pillars that I, that I kind of think of with what's serving LHA in terms of finances and our mission. Um, development, the voucher program, and the properties. So that's really the key tenements there. So we're all here to serve low-income residents in a way that is safe, secure, a brings a positive quality of life to these communities in which they live, um, support getting our people out into private housing with their voucher programs and keeping that all in compliance and safe and all of the things together. So that's what, when he speaks about the evictions, we never want to evict anybody. And we do process, or we have put in place a process to go through every possible way that we can support the resident before we get there. Um, we don't just jump to eviction because we also, we're the city. We understand that if somebody is evicted from an LHA property, if they don't have anywhere else to go, then we, we still are, they're still in our realm of, of influence. We are still serving them on, if, if they're unhoused, that is still a city, uh, you know, part of the city's mission as well, is to, to serve those residents. So it doesn't, it's not taken lightly. There was a wave because of COVID and the behavioral issues that exacerbated because of that um, but I just want to make sure everyone knows that we have sometimes you have to make tough decisions to make sure the rest of the community is safe and secure and has a good quality of life so, so a couple things I thought of while we were talking so the uh, <laughs> development to catch up really quick on where everybody put they all know um, so we're under construction now in two. that is a <coughs> 85 unit partnership that we did with MGL. Um, the Housing Authority invested in Kristen One. Um, that was one that we had untangled. So when we uh, when they eventually were going to do it, they were it was going to be a straightforward investment. But then we had the uh, ER funds, and they used that that actually impacted the development partner where they lost money in that deal. And so um, there was a plan to build the second one. They weren't going to go forward with that plan with the housing authority as it existed. When we took over, they came in, and that was the first one that we pulled the trigger on for the year. And we said, we we're willing to do it with you all. Um, we basically restructured both the Christmas 1 contract and the Christmas 2 contract. Uh, and and that the date for the Christmas one and two will turn over where we will assume management responsibilities. Uh, went from like 10 or 15 years, we brought, we brought it down to no later than five. It's incredibly important because we need the revenue from the operational side to help bolster the LHA fund. Um, but then in terms of how we fund the Christmas two, uh, once, once they start housing it, we're going to shift to what, 75, 25, Revenue split of which will be 75% of the revenues remaining after they satisfy all the requirements, which is another desire in terms of bolstering the financial stability of that project. 
Um, so that's going vertical now. And so, so that's under construction. We got tax credits awarded for um, Zinnia, which is the project just across the parking lot here. That's going to be another fully supported. I'm probably giving her development. Um, but I want you to base. I want to base my you all on this, so you can kind of. Um, so we will probably close April May on that project. Um, and go into construction this summer. That is 55 fully supported units, so that's 30% AMI and below. And we're working operationally on economies of scale and new facilities so that we can do this um, project three. Um, this is in the end. Um, we just went out for and our, uh, oh, so on Zenia here. So one of the things that we know that's occurring here is that when you, when you typically deal with a population, 30% AMI and below, we call it fully supportive services, simply because there is a higher need for things like mental health services, uh, recovery services, and things like that. So one of the things we were able to do with some of the harvest from our COVID is we're working right now with Recovery Cafe, which is a nonprofit we have that really works with people for recovery services. On the east side of this building, looking at a spot where we can do a ground lease with them so that they can build their facility uh, so they can operate their recovery cafe there, but it's adjacent to these properties of which we know we need those recovery uh, services are readily available. And so we're developing that. And then the LHDC owned a property on North over at 17th. So if you're familiar with where the lodge in Hearthstone is and Walgreens, there's a vacant lot there. Um, we just did an RFP for um, a development partner on that. And we are starting the process in terms of really figuring out what we need to do. On the development side, historically, the development corporation and the housing authority only wanted to build age-restricted units. So we only <coughs> have one non-age-restricted unit in our portfolio, which is the Aspen Meadow neighborhood. And what we know is that there's a tremendous need for um, there's a tremendous need for uh, non-age-restricted affordable housing units in our community. So as we look at development moving forward, that's really kind of what, that is what we're focusing on. And so what we're looking at on North Boulder is really a different approach in terms of, uh, and Molly can go into more detail on this later, but really uh, family-oriented housing that uh, brings a mixed use, and mixed use from, not as you would think in terms of commercial services there, but how do we bring more residential services there and or how do we bring more city services there? So is there a way to build daycare into this? Because we know daycare is a tremendous need for individuals in affordable housing. How do we bring potentially space for our youth service and senior services, library, rec center to have a presence in the facility? And so we're exploring all of that, obviously the financials We're on the front end of that project, and then to Molly's point about <clears throat> the interest now coming to us, uh, it's like Shark Tank. Um, if you all have ever watched Shark Tank in terms of the number of opportunities that are now coming to us in terms of partnerships. Um, we've got about six, five or six that we're, we're assessing right now, and it could be someone that has um, how a rental housing project that they were going to look at and do uh, more market rate because but because of the interest rates today and everything else they can't finance it so now they're going oh we may want to take it into the light tech world are you all interested in partnering with us and so it could be as basic as they want to partner with us as a special limited partner so they can get a tax exemption and that's pretty easy it can be as complex as 
they want to partner with us with tax credits and then we want the operational components and so you're just in a full on uh, negotiation trying to deal with this um, you know literally we had two or three that were pretty promising we had another one just hit us over the new year's holiday <clears throat> so we're really just evaluating these and it's turning into a point where we're thinking of that's the means we're not stuck with who can it. before it was like well who's there to what's partner with us now we can be really selective in terms of what we're going to bring forward in terms of partnerships so i'd say that's the orientation to the LHA <laughs> and where we are um i we, we did want to talk about the properties yeah you want to just give a brief intro to what properties we currently have um, on your sheet, you'll have a brief summary of each of the properties. So we have Aspen Rose Senior Apartment, which is 50 units, um, one and two bedrooms for those 62 and older. That was the project that was re-syndicated in 2021. So uh, remodeled, new flooring, new appliances, um, some facelifts inside and outside on that property. And then it shows all the funding that are associated in that one. With that re-syndication, it became an LHA-owned property. We have directly next door, we have Aspen Meadows neighborhood, which is the 28 family townhouses, um, two, three, and four bedrooms. And that is an LHA owned property. We have Briarwood Apartments that um, is adjacent to Veterans Community Project. We own that building as well, but we have 10 studio units, and that's um, LHA owned. Fall River, 60 units with 42 new bedrooms for those 62 and older. It has a multiple of multitude and multiple fundings there. Um, and the lodge and the Heartstone are very similar. They're both 50 units, one bedroom apartments um, for those 62 and older, and they are both funded through the HUD CAP program. Spray Creek, another 60 units, um, and that's over in Prairie Village, one and two bedrooms, and those are for 55 and over. So that's our only property that is not a 62 and over for seniors. We have a suite where we're at right now. We have 82 um, units here with studios, one bedroom, and then we have two two-bedroom units. We also have a manager's unit on site, and this is an LHA owned property. Village Place Apartments, which is the 72 units up on Main Street studios, one bedrooms and two bedrooms, um, 62 and older. That is currently an LHDC owned property. It's going to go through re syndication in 2024, and that will become an LHA owned property. And then we have two commercial properties, which is the 615 Main, which is right next door to Village Place. That is currently rented by um, Center for People with Disabilities, and they are a month-to-month lease because they are looking to purchase that building from LHA. And then we have, um, I have the wrong address, um, 1228 Main Street, not Kimbark, sorry. <laughs> yeah. um, that used to be the old LHA offices and is now housed by Veterans Community Project, and then we have a lease with them through April of 2024. Yeah, the, and just to give you a sense on the, kind of the opportunity, so are you all familiar with the Veterans Community Project? So um, that is the group that started in Kansas City, and they um, they focus on assisting and, and, how, and providing housing for unhoused veterans. Their model is a little bit different than most veterans programs because their philosophy is that uh, whether or not you are honorably or just if you serve the country at any point, our motto is we're here to serve you. Uh, they actually were introduced to us via uh, a development proposal that went before the city. So the development at Mountain Brook, uh, the Mountain Brook development, which is the area behind Target and a big area behind Target in Home Depot, um, they brought them in. And, and, as part of our inclusionary housing piece. Um, so on that development, you have eight, um, eight or 12, um, eight to 12 habitat remanding homes, and then you have 26 tiny homes that will be dedicated to uh, providing housing to unhoused veterans. Um, it is the that project that is probably the only project in the United States where they're intentionally developing um, uh, a unhoused program immediately adjacent to market rate homes. Um, I went 
went to Kansas City, kind of saw what they did. Their success rate is incredibly high in terms of how they deal with folks and how they get them into housing. Literally the day that I was there, there was a, a former Marine that had lost custody of his kids. They were in foster care because the mom had lost custody. And literally the day I was there, he got custody and the kids were coming in based on the work that they do. So they actually had rented a space um, and then got caught in a bad situation. Um, they came to us and said, we need help. We were in this transition. We needed to move our folks in with us anyway. So we moved them in that office. One of the things that we're starting to think about, and I think Zinnia is going to be the trigger point, is um, or maybe I'm going to ask them if they're interested in purchasing the entire ground we can borrow with, simply because we can then use Zinnia to bring our tenants over, but then they can use that to provide more units to individuals, to veterans who are experiencing homelessness, which we're all serving the same group. And the more we can spread it out to where we're dealing with it, the more uh, capacity that brings to all of the organizations. And so that, that may be a little bit of a way. But that's how the veterans came about. Tracy, do you want to give a brief overview of our, what we do with vouchers? So we have um, housing choice vouchers. We are funded for 518 vouchers. Um, that, that just means that we could go up to 500. Or 518. Um, at this point, we are up to 500 or 420. Um, under the housing choice vouchers is um, also the project-based vouchers. So we can pay some of our housing choice vouchers, and we can um, assign them to a white property. Um, and then that the um, tenants would get assistance at that property. Under the regular housing choice vouchers, it's tenant based. So they get a voucher, they go out into Boulder County, they find a unit, and we subsidize them in that unit. So that's, and it's all federally funded. So we work with them. We um, are regulated by HUD regulations. We have an admin plan that we have to do every year um, that, that outlines what our policies and procedures are. That's our rules are legible. So let me, so you've heard 500, we're, we, can, we can issue 518 vouchers, but we're, in, we're at 420. Um, I need to explain that a little bit. You don't get from HUD a voucher in the dollars. What you get is a pool of dollars, and they tell you, here's how many vouchers that you can issue. And so we've been relatively stagnant in terms of the dollars that we have. And so as inflation and rents increase, it actually reduces what you're able to actually issue in terms of the number of vouchers. And so in, in the, the tool, the HUD tool, you, you run all your rents and everything that's happening and then it says, here's what you can really issue in terms of the number of vouchers. And then, and then you have to have a reserve on top of that so that you can absorb any rental increases in there. And so the work that Kendra's really done for us is to identify what is that number that we need to hit so we have the appropriate reserves within the dollars that are available. And the closer you can stay to that, the more likely it is that you're gonna get additional revenues from HUD. Um, and what we were finding is they were probably in the 380, 370, range in terms of the number of vouchers they were keeping out on the street and so HUD never saw a need to give the housing authority more money because they weren't actually using those dollars and so we're now our target is 420 uh, and we're holding pretty close to that target. Oh, we're issuing. Yeah. Issuing, yeah. We've got a lot that's issued, but it, it adds us to, to 420. Right. Um, and that's just to make the case that we can get more money from HUD when the opportunities present themselves. And, and so we don't, we can't issue 520. Uh, we just don't have enough money. It's an ongoing performance management thing to get yourself up so you can issue more. And if you show you if, for if you're under under issue, um, they can come back and start taking your new reserves. So it's really important to keep the numbers up. So are you able to go
to ask for an additional funding on a yearly basis? Um, under the housing choice voucher, it's a, it's a, if they have additional money that they're, that HUD's going to um, appropriate, then it's, they, it's a, well, they'll let us know. We don't have to apply it. It's more formula. It's formula driven. So this last round, LHA got five. But that's five more than we did we had last year. So it might not be a lot right now, but it's, it's something. And, and having it leased up or stronger going in to get different kinds of vouchers like the veterans um, vouchers and, and other vouchers that we have And from what I understand, when we took it over, the, the philosophy of the housing authority was to get away from it. So they weren't going after a lot. We're trying to find them where they are. <laughs> Yeah, no, I mean, so, yeah. I mean, our, that's actually a good point. So when we did our debrief with HUD um, on the Lodge and Arsenal property, so it was a complete fail. And the guy told us the only reason <clears throat> that they got any points was because the building on the road was in good condition. And then he told us something that really kind of freaked us out, where um, when they were going and they were auditing the, the, the housing authority, they were asking for documents and the, and the and the staff was saying well we have to go to the board to release the documents audit, audit. audit documents and and so we immediately went to the board because they're all public documents and and talking to people who were on the board they never had the request and so <coughs> what HUD was saying going to flying under the radar not only were they flying under the radar they were intentionally being combated with them terms of the documents they were turning over and the point that he made is anytime I ask for something Kendra gives it and I can tell where everything's going so <clears throat> it was flying under the radar and being combated. Well, in every five years you have to get a five-year plan for under that housing voucher right. choice voucher program and their, their first one of the things that they had said in it was that their goal was within I think it was five years or ten years to be completely free from from HUD money, which means that they wouldn't have the voucher. Yeah, that is cool. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. so um, I think I think that's the reason that that, that LHA doesn't have any money. Yeah. Okay. So we Maybe go back to yeah. 4A and then that really does roll into <laughs> I think, I think we just one. 4C, we yeah. can keep kind of brief for now, but I do want to come back yeah. to that because it ties well. Yeah. But we've got to get A to complete. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, um, so, one thing I also wanted to point out for the orientation is we're going to get quarterly financial statements and voucher update so we get those on a quarterly basis. And Kendra's here to answer any questions about that. Sorry, Tom, I was just on the roll. Oh yeah, no problem. It's good. Here's the um, designated posting language from last year. If you want to use that as a promotion example. All right. So let's go on to 4A. Unless there's any other questions. Designate official posting location for LHA advisory board agendas. Um, so last year, the uh, the agendas. Uh, so they were on the city of Longmont website, the Longmont Housing Authority website the west side entrance of the Civic Center, and uh, practice. Oh, and we adopted the practice to post all the LA, at the LHA properties. Um, we could do that for this year as well. Unless we have any changes. Uh, yeah. All right, so we could do the, the again, it's the LHA Advisory Board agendas will be posted on the City of Longmont website, website, the west side entrance of the city center, and at and at all LHA properties. LHA and LHA. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. So I think that's a motion. Yeah. Okay. And, uh, I, I'll motion. I'll say, okay, I'll second. Yeah. All right. Any discussion? All right, so the motion on the table again is the uh, LHA agenda will be posted on the 
City of Longmont website, the Longmont Housing Authority website, the Westside Entrance of the Civic Center, and at LHA and LHDC properties. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All those opposed say nay. Any abstentions? No. Motion passes. All right. So let's go on to 4B, elect chair and vice chair for 2023. Do I have any nominations? I'll second. Do I have any competition? No. <laughs> I'm open to competition, too. <laughs> if you don't want to no. do it. <laughs> um, okay, so motion on the table uh, to have myself uh, and Tom to be as the chair. Um, so, any discussion? Yeah. Uh, do you want to share with how much work it actually is? I mean, maybe we should start with that, but like what it entails. Uh, it's really just running the meetings, and then I mean, I think we're we're uh, in terms of a group, a board, we're very, very open. You know, if there are any questions, and that's the way I run the meetings too. Yeah, it's like super formal in there. But less formal. Um, so if you have a question, let's get it out there. Let's discuss it, um, and then yeah, I've, I've put some agenda items on here. Not too much, but I mean, the city does. A lot of the weight. Yeah. 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 But uh, yeah, it's not, not too bad. Vice chair is well over his because that's when people show up. Yep. <laughs> 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 um, okay, uh, so let's vote. All in favor say aye. 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 Uh, all those opposed say nay. Extensions. All right, motion passes. I'll the chair. Uh, so let's vote on vice chair. Do I have any nominations? I mean, what does vice chair? Well, actually, what I do is just chair the meeting when Tom is not here and then uh, deal with the public uh, invited to be heard that shows up and everyone now I do. <laughs> so historically this year, right. no public shows up when Tom's in charge. <coughs> All the public show up. I missed two meetings. <laughs> Both meetings. Yep. Yeah. Both meetings. Yeah. Uh, but they're very calm. Unless somebody is just dying to have you know, yeah, take a stab at it. I'm nominated. I'm nominated. I'm sure. Any projects going on, so I have lots of time now. <laughs> the smoke is done. <laughs> 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 I know my project got canned. Thanks, Marshall Fire. Um, so if you want to keep going, find it. If you want to break, I'll second Marlene. All right, Marshall, I'll table to have Marlene be the vice chair in the discussion. <laughs> All those in favor say aye. 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 All those in favor say nay. Attention. All right. Motion passes. We will remain the vice chair. All right, let's go on to uh, 40. So I just want to kind of pick up the, the conversation where we were, but I'm going to keep it brief. Um, so we talked about what has been stabilized, really what has been part of the work plan, if you would call it, in the past three years. Um, and then we have spoken with staff to come up with a couple of items that are really part of our work plan for 2023. That does remind me, we do have um, overall goals for the LHA that I will also share with the new board members um, that the board approved early 2022. So I'll share those as well, um, just for orientation pieces. So our work plan does tier from those goals, but it's really what should we be focusing on this year. And so I wanna share what couple of things the staff has come up with, including not just this group, it's all LHA staff operationally. And then I was hoping that you all would either bring ideas right now or think about it and maybe discuss next meeting just for the agenda size. Um, 
and think about what, as an advisory board, uh, you would like to take on <coughs> as a focus for 2023. Um, so, considering that we consider LHA basically stabilized, now that's an ongoing, we are still finding things um, and fixing them as we go, but the staff really does want to focus on performance this year and making sure that our properties and our voucher programs are financially operating at a high quality and I shouldn't say quality. We think the quality comes in the resident culture and the staff culture and that type of thing, but more financial performance. We have, we're stabilized. Our reputation is what it is. Now we need to really use that as our footing to um, improve or maximize our financial performance on the properties. And really, is that's where we're going to bring in more development capacity and more funding capacity and all of those things. So that's it. There's a lot behind that, um, but that's one of the major themes operationally that the, the staff as a whole has come up with. Um, so if anybody has any ideas right now, um, or if you want to think about it and put this as an agenda item next month, that would be okay too. And also we didn't offer questions. I know that because that was, a, that was most of our meeting was orientation, but if there are questions, you can bring those up or think about them as well. Always just email First, you overwhelm and then think about them. And then right, them. exactly. Yeah. Like, it might be more in the absorption mode yes, right there. Right. Yeah. Uh, nice. Asset manager, asset management position to help focus on that? Not specifically. It's more like we um, do the asset management responsibilities with what we have, okay. but not, not a dedicated position. Is that something? Will you explain more about what, what an asset manager would do for the for the commission? So um, they would keep track of all of the assets, properties, ownership, owned, um, work on you know making sure that the capital plan is being met, so making sure that rehab is happening, money is being used nationally for those things, planning sort of scheduling, like okay, this property is going to need a new roof in 10 years, um, and just kind of handling long-term health of the buildings because most buildings are built to last 30 years and so every 30 years you really need to go through and make sure you know structurally it's sound um, which is what's happening at Village Place yay um, so it, that's sort of it's more like managing the long-term um, portfolio so take some pressure off of others yeah, right now we're definitely covering that as a team. It's primarily in Lisa's bucket as a manager of the properties and with her maintenance team. Um, this year, 2023, is the first time that we've had a capital improvements budget established for most or all? For most of the properties. Most of the properties. Right, so they have to have one. Um, we, didn't need, we didn't have budget to put away for capital needs that are outside of a re-syndication, which just means basically redoing the tax credits to get an investor back in money. and getting a big chunk to do a major rehab. So this is our first year with even any, a start of a budget for capital improvements. Um, so right now that's definitely a primarily Lisa, but shared effort, especially as it ties to the bigger rehab projects, which we dump into that development bucket. <laughs> I mean, this is where we're, we have start developing a spreadsheet with like different things so that we can start planning as we're starting to see like the lodge needs smoke detectors this year. We know the Spring Creek smoke detectors are starting to go. So we're kind of starting to plan that out with accounting as well. So that's definitely something we could use advice on, not necessarily since we don't have a position this year, but use ex, uh, your expertise and advice on how, now that we have budget set aside, what should we be looking forward to? We don't have one. Right? Nice. 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 No. We, we hired one, wasn't a good fit. And that's like our next goal for this year is to have an asset maintenance. Kind of like working with maintenance folks as well. Yeah, bridging maintenance, yeah. Yeah. operations, yeah. Yeah. finance, yeah. and development because, and really it's, you're getting by now, but it's going to become overwhelming. Especially if you have more development. Yeah, so yeah. more and more development, more, more things to go wrong. Everything requirements are changing every year, so yeah, it's someone who can like manage all of that. Part of what we're looking at too, um, 
So I think the most we built into the capital replacement is ten thousand dollars in the budget. Part of what we're looking at is trying to get enough money to hire an assistant director, um, which will absorb some of that and, and then get the, the revenue. So we're, we're chasing revenue right now to, to, to fill an assistant director um, because it's kind of maddening for the, two, for the two of us now. And so but that's part of it. And then we're bridging also with Katie. So Katie's on the city side, and so when we have the capital pieces, like Katie's working at Village Place and some of the other things. So we're, we're bridging from our housing side over, and then I think, you know, it's just gonna be the constant. So Katie's our development, affordable housing development project manager that with our ARPA funding, our American Rescue Plan, we hired to do about 8.5 million of um, ARPA funds that are directed to affordable housing. So she basically is acting as the development project manager for LHA at this point. And you know, someday that would definitely be, I hope, a position that we could. And that may be something LHA. too, as we as we get through the push of projects, we can maybe convert some of that position into an asset manager because we want to permanently uh, figure out the permanent financing outside of the heart of the project. Yeah. 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 And as a wave, <clears throat> and so what is it going to look like once the wave of funding is? Which then that would be one similar to what we did with Sarah's position is how do we bridge city funding and LHA funding to make that position exist in perpetuity? Sure. Yep. Let me send that along too as part of our orientation. So I think what we want to do then is let's next meeting we'll put it on the agenda to have a go over the 2023 goals and work plan to, to see going yeah, forward. Just put your thinking caps on and we'll go over the next meeting. <clears throat> Eric is sending you boards right now. So let's go on to number five development project updates. I think a lot of them went through. Yeah. yeah. We're, we're, yeah. We're a village place, we'll CPWD, building uh, sale. The other one I had on my list, Sunset Heights. That's that is Okay, so change. So, it's okay. I had it on my list and I wasn't quite sure what it's called. Yeah. So Sunset Heights started out at Sunset Heights, yeah. changed to Bluebird, nobody liked Bluebird, mm -hmm. and then landed on the ESI. Same project. Mm -hmm. Okay, three names. That makes yeah. that makes more sense to me. I'll just go over item A and half of item B. That's yeah, what I marked yeah. off that, mm -hmm. that Harold already touched on. So for Village Place, this is the resyndication of the tax credits for another 15 year plus compliance period. Um, meaning we're bringing in a new investor to refinance essentially the property, keep it in the affordable stock that way, and with that, because <clears throat> funding comes with, is a major rehab. So uh, we are on track on schedule, which at this point we have an architect, hi, uh, not contracted yet, we haven't signed the contract, but contracting is in process. Um, we hired um, Roseman and Associates, so they have a lot of affordable experience. They don't have a ton in Colorado in the affordable range. They do have market rates affordable in Colorado, but they have a huge portfolio in Missouri and they're setting up a Colorado office, but they had by far the best approach when it came to senior focused properties, tenant in place rehabs, meaning what do we do with our tenants while their, their apartments are getting renovated? Um, and really they're just the way they approached it in terms of resident interactions and involving the residents in the process was really what sold us on them. Pricing was pretty similar to others. Um, we did negotiate it down a little bit and um, we loved what they, the product, the, the aesthetics of the product that they were presenting and um, they're really eager to work more in Colorado, so we thought that there was there's some price advantages there, but really what sold us was the, the team and how they treat the residents as they do this process, specifically in a senior property. So 
they are big on engagement and we thought that would be really important at Village Place. Mm -hmm. So we have an architect on board. So soon enough we'll be doing, they're just doing some preliminary work right now and soon enough we'll have that first resident meeting with the architect to go over, um, you know, what we've, what they're going to do a walk of the building, do that assessment of what's there and we'll start working on that priority list of what we can include in the rehab. Um, we released an RFP for a general contractor yesterday, no, last Friday. Um, and what we're doing is we're just going to, this is, this is out, out of my um, comfort zone because I'm used to strict federal funding where you just do bids and it's price based. But what we're doing, which is more common in the um, low income housing tax credit world, is we're putting out to get pricing and qualifications pricing is only for like the things their their profit their fees their the general conditions is what you what you call it um, just to see we can still use some competitive pricing there but we're really looking for quality um, so that is out on the streets we'll be doing a walk of the site with potential bidding contractors on the I think the 19th of January and then that will close here towards the end of January and we'll be selecting a contractor. Um, so in terms of timeline and schedule, we're still we're looking at that March timeline for our first resident meetings with the hired firms and starting that resident engagement process and the design selection process in earnest. Um, and then there was, oh, we have to start hiring our tenant relocation specialist this spring as well so that's the next steps we still are shooting for a closing of the new financing by December of this year um, we are exiting with the existing tax credit equity investor right now that should be happening in February in February um, so it's moving right along it's a big project we, oh we have a new investor the new investor and our lender are selected it's the same team we did for Aspen Meadows. <coughs> so this is um, RBC is the investor yeah. and First Bank is the lender. And so that team works great together on Aspen Meadows. They know us, we know them. It's a very predictable process. We also worked with RBC on the Christman 2 project too. So they're, they're just all over Lama. So um, it is moving right along. Uh, to the construction one, it's hard to tell. For the architecture, we got six, five or six. We interviewed three. So we have, and we put the evaluation criteria right up front in the, the request for proposals, so they know what, what's gonna be evaluated. Um, in this case, we're looking at your experience with LIHTC construction or like tenant place rehabs, just like this. Um, your uh, prior projects in the area. Um, we then call references. Some of them we know pretty well, and some of them we would need to find out more information about. And then, of course, evaluating the pricing and interviews. We would do interviews as well. Uh, then, usually, we have at least three people on an, an evaluation panel. So that's for this place. Any questions? So we already kind of heard about the CPWD building sale and what that's about. Um, so we? let's go back to the Village Place. Sorry. <laughs> so Village Place, a um, couple of things. The bidding process and your question is what we in terms of what we have to do. And you'll hear, hear us refer to code of silence, which means if you're not on the interview panel, you're entitled to know nothing. And so there'll be times I'll be on it, I'll know there'll be other times I'm not, and they can't even tell me what's going on. So it's pretty regimented from a, a purchasing policy standpoint to a city purchasing policy standpoint to a federal. So we have to be really focused on that. Those places interesting because we're also having to marry two projects together. So on the city side, we have the redesign of Conklin Street, which is going to be from 
going to be to first. And, and that's part of the uh, first main transit station. So it's right in the middle of the street. And we have drainage problems in the back of the village place that we have to correct. So we're actually working and talking to the city engineering department about the drainage improvements. And there's some of the stuff that they're actually going to absorb in their project in order to get this done. And then we have to correct them a little on time because what we don't want, we can't really start before they do. And so we're having to manage two different projects to really narrow in the time and make sure we do it right from a horizontal infrastructure standpoint in terms of the weight. So the Center for People with Disabilities is interested in purchasing the building. We don't really need this building in our portfolio. It doesn't really serve our mission. Um, and it could be a revenue source. If we sell it, it could be a revenue source to put back in and repurpose. So um, we right now have uh, the city's land uh, contractor doing a market analysis to see what a fair market price would be for that building. And then we'll be negotiating with the CPWD here soon. They're on a month to month lease right now until, well, to give us time to do this process and have that negotiation. So that's underway. We're just waiting for the market analysis to come through. Do you know what that's expected at all? Um, he, it, it sounds like there's not a lot of good comps. So we're, we're working with him right now to figure it. It's taking him a little bit more of an effort than um, he anticipated. I'm trying to let my latest from him. Chatting over the holidays about commercial real estate. I, I don't know. But I am I'm gonna call him and just see if he needs to chat. Um, there was I, I was trying to pull this up to see what to recall what the um, unique circumstances were. Anyways. No, we're going yeah. to number six. Um, I was gonna put that by the LH commissioners is property tax exemption. Policy revisions. Okay, so granted we have a half hour left. Um, <laughs> I will just go over the purpose for this. So I included the full red line in this for you all to see, including some discussion items. We plan to take this to the LHA board on January 31st. Um, this is a new policy. We just got it approved the first go around last February. Um, Really what that policy did at the time was primarily set the, the calculation formula for the fee. No, actually, let me back up. What is a property tax exemption policy? Housing authority, there's Colorado statute that um, provides that if a housing authority is a special limited partner on a, the ownership of a property, then that whole property is can be property tax exempt. So this is very attractive to private affordable housing developers um, to, to get, but it's, it's a cost savings. And so housing authorities across the front range have policies in place describing when we would consider being a special limited partner, what type of criteria we would want in exchange for that, that tax benefit for private developers. Um, and so what our policy did that was put in place a year ago it was really an advance of Christmas coming up and making sure we had some sort of formula set for what that fee would be. So in a sense, they, they pay a fee up front and in exchange, um, they get long-term tax savings. So, and it's substantial and it's very valuable to a private affordable housing developer. So what, in the last year, we've had, as part of those, those uh, proposals coming at us from all directions, we are getting multiple requests to be, to, to utilize this policy. Um, but what we were finding is our policy didn't necessarily go into um, how the SL, how getting on, getting on the ownership structure was needed to happen. Um, what type of evaluation criteria we would want to consider in order to enter this partnership, for example, are you just, are you wanting this fee reduction so that you can 
increase your own profits, or are you going to use that to help benefit the, you know, lower the affordability of the property or something? Um, and then, like a, an actual process for the application, um, which wasn't really specified. Um, so, there's a couple things in here about the formula. I tried not to touch the formula too much because that's really, we just went through that a year ago. There's nothing really wrong with the formula. It's really more process and purpose that I wanted to make sure we included in here. Um, so a couple of the key things. Our original policy was, was intended to only be for new developments and how it was written. There was no way for an existing affordable property to try and apply for this and um, how to work with them on that. So that's one of the specific requests that have come to us is an existing property um, that did not go through this process with the former LHA board for various reasons. Um, and now they're interested and we need to come up with some policies and procedures for how if if we're going to do it, how does that look? Um, and then a couple of the, the comment bubbles that you see are really from review of other policies in the region and um, just seeing if we want to consider certain things in order to just see what's out there and see if we want to match up with it. Um, including, well, no, come on, let me come back to that one. Some housing authorities add on an ongoing management fee. Do we want to consider that? Um, the existing fee calculation methodology only uses the first year NOI. And, but NOI is usually increased throughout a compliance period, so do we want to try and do an average because that it's a pretty good deal if you only use the first year? There's just some nuanced things in here that um, we have notes about if we want to consider doing it this way based on what we see out there. The biggest one that we really want advice on is related to vouchers. Some of the policies in the region that we found include a preference um, in the evaluation process uh, for, for properties that, for, that house voucher holders. But it's very much just a, it's part of the application process and the evaluation, but it's not necessarily a, a, an eligibility criteria. What I mean by that is, one of our existing affordable housing developments in the city asked us if they could benefit from this. Their, their average um, unit mix does not fall below 50% AMI. It is primarily over 50, but all of the units are under 60, but it's really like 60 with a couple of lower ones. Um, so what that means is they don't actually qualify currently, but they are a significant provider for Housing Choice Voucher residents. And they said, isn't that worth something to the LHA? So we have a goal of trying to make, do what we can to make landlords um, very receptive to Housing Choice Voucher holders. And is this a way that we should consider um, rewarding that, essentially? This is not in any policies that I could find, specifically as an eligibility thing, if you're not averaging below 50% AMI on your units. Um, so it's not that affordable, essentially. It's not as affordable as most. Is this something that we want to consider? So this will be a question we take to the board and I would love your feedback and input, whether it's this moment or um, through through an email afterward, anything like that. Any thoughts? If you don't meet this criteria, but you meet this one, So I say currently, and this is, this is what we already had in our policy, at least 20% of the units must be provided at rates affordable to households earning 50% or less of the very median income, or, at least 25% or more of the units must be committed to be rented to voucher holders. And I made up that 25% so I'm subject to. I mean, the way I see too is they're getting their market rent from exactly. the voucher. Right. I put that in here. So where's the, I mean, so, so they're making out for what? So they're going to add on top of that then a property tax exemption. 
so I feel like maybe with that, um, some, some more skin, like more benefit for us as a substitute partner, like a member, right? Or a management fee, or we get to be a property manager. Because we have that in the bars where we have to be as a special limited partner at any time, we can say, we're going to take over property management of the property. So there, on that note, the policies in, in the region are, there's a spectrum, right? Some are like, we, we just don't want to go there. Some want to go there full form. Our thought is, somewhere in the middle. I mean, we having a, we put in here a, a rofer at fair market value. And then the debt plus taxes option, if we we're already a, like a co-developer or a general partner. Um, we should make that fair market value without the tax exemption. Thank you. You don't want fair market value assuming the tax exemption stays because right. then the property is very valuable to the owner. Right, right, right. Yeah. Do you, do you mind checking that, that out and helping me with some language on that? Yeah. That would be so helpful. Because it wasn't clear in one of ours. And now you got stuck. We're paying. So, so part of it is we have a lot of people with volunteers who can't find places to live. Oh, yeah. That's the so, value. Yeah. The value is and is people that we get vouchers to finding places to live. And I think I would structure it as they accept the voucher from the Long Line Housing Authority because the other thing that we're seeing in Long Line that's a little bit different is the same thing is happening in Boulder and Louisville and Longmont, or Louisville, Lafayette, and Superior. And so what's happening is whether it's BCH or BHP, a lot of their voucher holders are coming into our community, which is limiting access to our voucher holders, which I think if we gave priority to LHA voucher holders and it's at a certain percentage, then that clears the path for us to be more in more direct contact. Similar to what we did with um, Called Conte Stack, the one we're helping them with. Uh, farmhouse. Uh, farmhouse. Conte Stack Farmhouse. <laughs> um, farmhouse, we're doing that with, with it. But I mean, that's the value I think that we, we get. I think we're just coming from another housing center Yeah, so is that dependent on AMI though? Voucher amount? No, the voucher amount is set by um, the payment standards set by HUD. Okay. Um, and that's that's a yearly thing. And so it's all Boulder County payment standard. So I and I don't know if you know, I just find that there are amounts of uh, like so for I had a I had a three or four bedroom recently and I had a uh, gal and she just had two kids and she had a, a Boulder County partner voucher for like thirty two hundred never seen an amount that high. But um, she certainly qualified for it, whereas someone in Walmart housing has the same amount of kids in the household. And they're at 21 so, bedroom size. So it, it depends on bedroom size. So a voucher is issued by what they qualify as a bedroom size. So if they're renting a four bedroom, they only get a two bedroom payment standard. So but a household of the same size could get a higher bedroom size through the reasonable accommodations for medical equipment, therapy, and stuff like that. So the same household makeup can have two different payment standards based on the yeah. size. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, so I just find it just as the end consumer, I, I find that one my house tends to lower as well. For whatever reason. I don't know. I think that might be a good meeting. I'm going to hear about your experience. Yeah. And it may be historically, because I know, was, were, we, were they on top of it historically on the Right. So it could be that historically you saw that, but I know Tracy's had to catch up to, to where it is the same. So I just had to make it a because I had raised rents for three years and I raised rents $150 on a few dollars on the few dollars to that. And he said, not only are we not going to give you the increase, we're going to be decreasing, not just getting it. So I made it a little bit. Sorry, you got to go. 
because I rented at Mercury for $500 more than I was offering to loan my house back. And they said, no, we're not, not only that, but we're reducing her rent amount, which I've never even, I've never experienced that before. So, so it could be a change in the family size, a change in the voucher size. It wasn't a change in family size. So what we're what we're finding so is here. yeah, what we're finding is that the practice um, was following the admin plan. So our admin plan says a certain you know family makeup qualifies for a certain bedroom size, and it was all over the board. So we're pulling that back in, and we're making sure that voucher size is match what we say we're going to do in the in our planning. So if they had a three bedroom and you were getting a three bedroom payment standard but they only qualified for a two bedroom, they pull them back. Well now she's one less, so that's good. <laughs> right? So well if she has a voucher she needs she can't find anywhere to go a voucher and not the two yeah, I'm just saying. I mean, I, either you're gonna, either you're, either you're housing the people, or you're not, right? I mean, and so, and, and, and as a landlord, you're only willing to do. I was willing to offer it at less than market because she didn't want to be eight years, and I was uh, willing to offer it at less, and, and but not that much less. So this is something I would have heard about. So yeah, let's. So, let's so talk. part of it. So to kind of get into vouchers, it gets it gets interesting because we have the admin plans of which are responsible to HUD and so some of the policies that we put in place um, in terms of so if you're getting a voucher it's your responsibility to notify us on any changes that occur within the voucher and so what we're finding in, in some of our voucher holders is that changes have occurred and they haven't notified us, and it's changed their income qualification, it's changed all sorts of stuff. Of which we've identified fraud. I mean, we've sent stuff to the Office of Inspector General, we sent stuff to the police department because of the nature of it. And so I get involved in it when it's over $5,000. And so I've had conversations where, you know, if you have two kids under 10, then plan may qualify you to just be a two-bedroom, but once the kids become teenagers, then the plan qualifies you to be in a three-bedroom. There's some, some version of this. It's, it's all over the place. And, and or then if your kids are working, you have to report the income of your kids because that comes from the income qualification. So in all of this, we have HUD sort of hanging out here in terms of the admin plan and what you can and can't do. And, and it is pretty strict. And, and so, um, and it gets into the, the individual specifics. And so within the last three months, I've made three or four agreements with individuals who have owed anywhere from five to $12,000 to have a repayment plan and so they can keep their vouchers. And so it, it's individually specific. Um, we do use the same tables, um, but yeah, I think we need to talk to Tracy. Yeah, so I was just trying to speak towards why we yeah. have been, I mean, yeah, how we she have benefited. Yeah. 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 So, so, so you two talk, I want to get, get this yeah. property tax yeah. exemption. I, that was my only uh, Continue, go. So, my other comment too with the are we looking as just an or just to if you have 25 percent or more committed to voucher holders you're able to get the property tax exemption you might want to add another band in there with this as another bullet point to be like at least 30 percent of the units or 60 percent or less area median income and at least 25 percent are well, and I would add that you maintain that amount, not just at right. the time of your application. You're like, great, you meet your criteria, it has to well, be sustained. And then that means we have to then check up on it and what's that, which process a, a management fee would be applicable. Okay, yeah. so I. Well, is this, would this be the only one that would be part of that? A checkup on an annual basis or. It, because they don't already get the property tax credits. I'm just thinking of a 
is it administratively or is this the only one that you would have to apply under his voucher center? Or does Chad from the or So as a special limited partner at all times, usually in your operating agreement, you have the right to ask to review their financials. Whether you choose to do that, you know, that's your call. I would say if, if you're going to ask them to maintain something that is going to be quite intensive, then you want to maintain like that because that's not something anyone else is going to be checking. That's not a chapter requirement. That would just be us requirement. Well, no, I'm just saying if, if you're doing the property tax credits, so are you are you required to send reports and monitor that? Oh, yeah. 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 So it takes us out of the equation of having to monitor. It. That's my point. So if we okay. if we have to monitor the, the vouchers. That's additional administrative yeah. duties on us. Right. I would say only for the <coughs> voucher piece. If they're going under that criteria, then we would want a management fee to be checking that, whether it's yearly or sporadically. I mean, I would always be wanting their um, your, their yearly audits plus whatever they give to the chapter to make sure that they're ever needing clients. That's, that's, that's in here. Yeah, because yeah, usually the only way you can get out of this deal is if, right. they, if they're not compliant. Otherwise, you can't really. So when I'm thinking overall, I don't think that, I think there's still questions to answer and tweak, and I don't think we're ready necessarily for January 31st board approval. I think that maybe through email, I'll start some of these edits and we can kind of correlate, correlate it all together um, and come up with, and fill some of these holes. And then I'll plan for a February board approval. Um, so I will do that. We'll, we'll take this one kind of into a, you know, red line process on, Email, if that works. So, so kind of in line with that, right, too, is I think in, in terms of management, you've got to build something in there because we're going to add vouchers as an option. Right. If you go the voucher route or even like it's pilot, you've got type, yeah, yeah, type, type one, type two, type three. 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 If you're doing type three, there will be an additional gotcha. management fee over the next amount of Okay. So. okay. All right. So, I'll get us a couple of those start things started and then <laughs> update any of these questions and send that around so we can just have a working. I did virtually and none of the sessions worked virtually. Okay. So we are sitting we are trying to watch them now and putting them aside. There was them. one about the end of the 15 year tax compliance. I was really interested in that. Yeah, I'll get you the recording and the document. I've got I have access because okay. I was registered, just nothing worked. So anyway. That was really good. Decision mapping for property management. Is um, this something we could cover in 10 minutes or do we want to? It's, this is, yes, in basic form. Okay. Because we haven't yet prepared it. Okay. But. Sounds good. So let's move on. So let's go to 10. Yeah. Well, uh, sorry. Let's let me just give the, the intro. I'm just going to give the intro because right. this week might be taking January 31st. Um, Commissioner Tim Waters has requested this in prior board meetings last summer about just just a it's it's really lines of authority for property managers to have on site um for decision making like what needs to be elevated what can they what are they responsible for um things like that so we are putting together like a decision making map and that we are hoping to tie with an sop manual for them so when we have that together we'll probably send that around um and would welcome your input so that will also be an offline thing because it's in development Okay, that's all we have. Uh, let's go on to the village report update on operation. I think we probably covered a lot of that, right? I mean, well, sorry, the occupancy report, let's go over that and property updates. Okay. So, so we're still sitting about 93% occupied. So um, for 2023, on all of my managers and maintenance, we have a goal to increase these occupancies working together. Um, now we're kind of through a lot of the supply and demand issues. Um, we're fully staffed on the maintenance side, um, almost fully staffed on the property management side. Our goals are to really get these units leased, rented, and turned fast. I can say just this morning, Tracy and I were talking in the office. I've done nine credit reports this week, and it's only Tuesday. So that means 90 rentals between HCV and the property management side. So that's amazing. Um, you'll see in my notes um, where we have some down these vet units. We've had a few um, released. Under the vet contamination, though, on the down unit, 7114, that is actually now back online and rented. So we're hoping for a rent to move in this week or next week. Um, 
have still working through some meth units. A lot of them are just the, those cleaning reports, those two that were pending the cleaning reports, we just got those released yesterday, and they are now in the adjuster and um, reconstruction hands. So hopefully we're getting those back online in the next couple of weeks. I'm not gonna go into too much details this week or this month. <laughs> well, and, and, then, and, the, and the goal is to have 95% my, most of the properties have a 97% um, gold list for 2023 of occupancy, but the suite's at 95%. We did make the suite a little bit lower due to um, the clientele and that we're working with mental health partners to sell half the units. They don't always have to go something. Yes, and they're having a hard time. Um, I had a meeting with MHP yesterday. They pulled eight names in December and only heard that, no, sorry, total of 14 names in December and have heard back from two. So, just to see them off. They're, and they're working off two different lists right now. They're working off an old EOH list and they're working off um, local case conferencing. So, I believe we told 20 how far the suites is. They got three. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we're going to have to get some non recommended units. Those are like employee units that are set aside that we don't generate rent on and we won't be generating. Or, um, yeah, those are the, the two employee units. So right now we have um, the heart. Yeah, the Sweet has one and Village Place has one right now. And those were identified in the tax credit proposal, which I think in this one. And the management agreements. And, and the management agreements, so the investors and everybody have to get involved with it. So. They're approved through Chapa for the suites and Village Place. Um, Aspen Meadows does have, Aspen Meadows neighborhood does have a manager living on site, but she is paying towards rent, so. Um, for the cleaning, we um, work, well, our testing company, Recycle, goes out for bid for the um, decontamination. And so they work with anywhere from two to six people. They just send a mass email out. Um, for the remediation and the reconstruction of the units, we were running into a problem after the Marshall Fire of getting anybody to bid. So we found one contractor that was really willing to come in and work on these. We actually just had a second one, Palace Construction, who did Aspen Meadows Senior renovation. They are now getting into reconstruction. So they've already walked one unit here and they're gonna start walking our other ones for a second bid. But our insurance adjuster on the MES side has really works with who's ever doing the bid reconstruction. Um, to go through and make sure it's fair. Most of these are insurance claims, so we get most of our money back on those. Part of what I'm tossing around in my mind is to look, so what we do on the city side is look at on-call contracts. And so we bid out on-call contracts. And so there's an economy of scale that occurs because you can guarantee that we now know here's how many we tend to average a year, those types of things. If we if we do an on call contract bid, then maybe we can get some better numbers, but those are things we've got to work through. Um, because some of it, you know, when we first took over, we had one that we knew ahead of time meth was involved, and so we had to kind of scramble to get a remediation company because we couldn't even score the furniture. And so that all had to be done with a remediation company, they had to get a pod, they had to seal the pod, and, and it was a mess. So we're gonna explore some different opportunities. So it depends on the level of the activity. Yes, if we have um, a low level, like um, one that just requires a light cleaning, that's the light cleaning is still done by certified. Yeah, that has like to be certified through special. Colorado. They have to have all their certifications. That's typically about a 30 day turnaround by the time we go through the testing, the cleaning, and the retesting, and getting the report to the county and the city to release the unit basically for a habitation. Um, a mid grade, which I'd say anywhere from 100 parts per million to maybe 600 parts per million is a deeper clean, where that could take a cleaning, a testing, and then go back into cleaning, then removal of certain items, which could be an HVAC system. Um, an appliance, it could be the countertops or the windowsills have to come out. It all depends on where the contamination is in the unit. And then when we start getting those higher ones, um, 
those could be six, seven months. It, it just, it all depends. Like I had, one of my most recent evictions, the resident was only in there for three months and it tested the highest Boulder County has ever seen. And they were not cooking in there, but they were smoking quite a bit. And and it, but that was down like a year, right? No, this one. This is new. This is new. Oh no, but wasn't there one recently that we just put back online that was down? I think four yeah, years we, had, we had one almost down a year because um, the Marshall Fire impacted it. The testing couldn't be done as fast because they were doing Marshall Fire okay, things. Yeah. Okay, gotcha. So the, the pro, there is no profile. All ages, we're having them in you know, senior, everywhere. Um, your family support. Here's the thing. We are not hiding this in one any way, shape, or form. If we are being transparent about it, we have an insurance um, writer, which is rare. And we are, Chapo has already come to us and like, how come it, you're reporting meth units so high? And we're like, nope, we're, we're, we're the same. Is. We're the same as everyone else. We're just telling you and doing the right thing and actually reporting it and cleaning it and making sure it is habitable instead of pushing it under the rug. So um, anyways, we're no different than anybody else. And literally the profile is anybody. It's an ongoing issue. Yep. Yeah, this part right here. So yeah, this, yeah, this isn't an OHA issue. Um, it happens in market rate. Yeah. yeah. It's increasing partly because we're we're getting more advanced in testing and um, doing it more often. Well, I think locally it's Sarah. Yeah. Sarah, Sarah does crime free since so she sees the private. I, I would say, just like Molly indicated, a lot of folks are testing even though they have the information just because it's a tested, lot. It's yeah. if you're required and to the law, the law states you should, not you shall. So it leaves many, many. I mean, and the issue is too, a lot of these buildings in Longmont, I mean, there's they're some that are pretty old. Like you look at, it's called the Park now, the old lot of mill on 14th and over. They don't. They don't test there, and if they were, it could have been. It could have been three, four, or five minutes ago, right? And they just painted, and they're going to get it from paint. So, it's it's a very tricky. Meth is a very tricky thing for many. My question is not as towards 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 people who want to. What's the trend? So it's a, it's it's already a revenue problem, and. So what we were able to do in this budget, so we created two funds, so we created a capital improvement fund and where we could within the department budgets and we, we created a, a, a meth remediation fund because um, housing authorities are lucky, they can get insurance for that remediation. Private landlords cannot get it, but, can, but we're concerned about when they're gonna pull the trigger and stop insuring meth remediation. Is that just covered? Just the remediation, and it's a double. It's a double bit, yeah. yeah, so it's a double bit. We have a deductible. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So the deductible plus gets down. So, do we plan on certain here? So we're starting to, to get that and do that as part of the overall budget. Um, they build it in the we build it in on the vacancy, but. I mean, we're still, I mean, we had to figure out how to do snow removal because they didn't budget for snow removal. We had to figure out how to do landscaping because they didn't budget for landscaping. So on the, on the meth piece, um, so the time can vary. The other thing that we're, we're I'm starting to be more cognizant of is the consumer is becoming more um, educated. And you can buy meth tests on Amazon that are really good quality. And what I'm starting to hear is that consumers, when they rent properties, are doing their own meth test. And the minute that meth test comes back, everybody's legally obligated to deal with it. And so, I mean, I've talked to a, a private um, manager of some multifamily units, and everybody's like, well, what do we do? As the consumers are getting more educated. Um, 
No. And well, insurance riders aren't, aren't yeah, available yeah. for those. Sorry. No, but if somebody is, I mean, have we ever had that issue with somebody testing the unit and they came back and that's positive and then? In the private. Us? No, for, for any good. of our units. So no, actually, because we do, we're on top of it. If okay. I get a police report, mm -hmm. if I get you testing a turnover. Not my of new construction. That's part of we That's are what I was going to get to. So, um, so two things that we're working on is um, how do we build in the testing component for and to Lauren's point, new construction is easier because you can hold people accountable for it because there's no question of whether it was contaminated before or not. Uh, we're working with the insurance company. Uh, because the insurance company has to be beside us on this because we don't want to create a situation that creates more impact on the insurance company and then they go, oh, you're doing this proactively, we're cutting your insurance. And so that's a piece of it. The other thing that we're doing is we had a meeting with a company out in New Zealand um, on, we need to get an advocate at the meeting this afternoon, Sarah. Um, so they're, they're one of the few companies in the world that are doing meth detectors not the only company in the world and um, so it's been vetted by the Southeast Asian testing laboratory um, and to give you a sense they're saying to us that it will detect meth for somebody that smoked it outside and then walked in and it's on their clothes it's like one part per billion um, and it's tamper resistant so we had an initial meeting Molly just said we've got a meeting this afternoon they have sent us a proposal in terms of doing a beta test on these, um, these meth detectors. And, and so we're evaluating it. Um, we push them, to, so they're working with hotels right now. In the US. In the US, they That's just the got their FCC market. and other approvals, but they're working with hotels. They're not, I think we were one of the first governments to reach out to them. Well, housing providers, generally. And and so we asked them to do a beta test that gives the price break so that because if it works then it's better to use a governmental entity than use a hotel and um, so we're going to see what they come up with and start testing it in facilities that in apartments that have been remediated or in new construction um, and it's like real-time information. In the actual units? In the units. Okay, it's, silent. it's like a silent smoke alarm where it alerts uh, we can get attached to that hotel at a threshold of what it measures. Uh, and one device does um, up to a three bedroom apartment, one story. Yeah. Yeah. We got that. So that's this morning that's up to it. That's what she just said. So, okay. so we've got a meeting this afternoon. We'll know more. But if it works, then we're going to also transition that to Sarah and the Crime Free Group because we're going to let people in the entire community know because I think that's a protection for private landlords and what's up. Uh, let's switch over real fast. Property updates. Do you want to find anything out? Like a couple of minutes? Um, yeah. Everything's going good. It was a quiet month for December. We did um, the bingos at all the properties where we use the resident um, event funds. And LHA staff went in and did big old bingos and uh, like a year end bash with the residents. And I think it kind of really boosted the morale of the residents and stuff after some stuff that has happened over the last few months. Um, my team's goal for the next year is to do quarterly events like that fun events or educational events with the staff um, even more often. So we're getting into that now. So. Okay. All right, so let's uh, adjourn the meeting at 11.06. Uh, everybody for showing up. <laughs>